Good morning and welcome to GCAF. Those of uh, you who are also joining us online, welcome. We're glad that you're here. If you have Bibles, you can open up to Matthew chapter 27, and we will pick up from where we uh, finished last Sunday, verses 27 to 31. Matthew 27, verses 27 to 31. Verse 27 starts with this. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. Now, if you remember last Sunday, it was the Roman trial where Pilate, Pontius Pilate, held, was the judge and there was a trial. The Jews brought Jesus before Pilate, and they accused Jesus with all these false accusations. They could never prove Jesus was guilty. They had to make up lies. And now they're in before Pontius Pilate, and they kept refusing six times Pontius Pilate insisting that Jesus was innocent and should be released. And they kept saying, taking no for an answer, and that they kept saying no to that uh, request, I mean, and they would insist in more and more and make up more and more accusations to the point that they threatened Pilate, that they would tell Caesar about it, and Pilate gave in. But before this incident, you can also remember that Pilate had already Jesus scourged. And the way Romans would scourge prisoners, it's not the 39 lashes, 40 minus 1. It's, they have no limit. And so, you could, this was already Jesus, bloodied already by a previous scourging, beatings. And now, the death sentence has passed. Pontius Pilate says, take Jesus to be crucified. And this is where we are right now in verse 27. The darkest history of mankind where man, sinners, would inflict upon the most holy one, the most innocent one, Jesus Christ, unspeakable torture, shaming, mocking, and take it, before taking him away to be crucified on a cross as a criminal. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. When we read the great suffering of Jesus Christ, maybe a thought has come into your head that you say, Lord, why does Jesus have to suffer like this? I know that He has to die for the sins, to pay for the penalty of sins. I know. But why does He have to suffer in this way? Couldn't there have been a kinder way, a less painful way for Jesus to pay for our sins? Couldn't there have been a more humane way wherein if I, if I look at the Gospels, there was already previous attempts to his life in response to Jesus' teaching and his truth and his authority. People hated him and tried to pick up stones to stone him to death. Why not that, Lord? At least the stoning wouldn't have been this terrible. Or what about that time, Lord, wherein the Jews once again got so angry with the truth that Jesus was talking about, was teaching them, and they tried to throw him off the cliff. How about that, Lord? Wouldn't that be enough that he would have died as well 
and that would, he was still innocent as well, and that wouldn't be enough because of the worth of Jesus Christ? Why does he have to suffer? I have two questions for us this morning. By God's grace, we would find in His Word. The first question would be, why does Jesus have to suffer like this? Why not another way? Why not an, a lesser amount of sorrow wherein He's not mocked like this? He's not handled by sinners like this. And if we know and we are sure now of this answer of the first question, it will prepare you and it will make you able to answer the second question that you are going to have to ask for yourself. And that is, how do we make sense of our suffering? When you and I will now suffer, as we will suffer in this life, how do we find the answer? Why? Why? And we look at other people and, and we say, they're not suffering like I am. You would need the sure, solid answer of question number one before you can find peace for your soul and an anchor and a rock for your question number two. So let's start with number one. It says, why did Jesus have to suffer like this? Why not another way? And let's start with this, because it was the plan of God. It was the eternal plan of a good God that Jesus would suffer in this way. And we, was, we would really have a hard time, you know, trying to digest that. Because if you're a parent right now, if you have a loved one right now, if you have a pet right now that you love, you can't, for the life of you, you can't even imagine that you would put yourself, your, your loved one to such torture. We don't even want them to fall off, fall down the stairs. We don't even want them to scrape their knees. We don't even want them to to be hurt by other kind, unkind words by other people. I was talking to somebody and, and, and the person was re, re, uh, re, uh, recounting her past as, a, as an uh, elementary student that she was being bullied, bullied in, the, in, the, in the class. She was literally being slapped. They would take her, the bullies would take her test paper so that she would fail her grades. And I was listening to that. I got so angry and I said, what about your other classmates? Did they, weren't they doing anything? Didn't they know about that? Because if I was your classmate, I would stand up for you. I can't bear it that you would go through such suffering like that. And to see here that this is the truth, crystal truth, we have to start thinking Never to disassociate, disconnect God, who God is, His character, that He's good, that He's wonderful, His love, that He would have this plan that for His only begotten Son to undergo this kind of suffering, that this was the part of the plan of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy, Holy Spirit before eternity, and this was the plan. Son, you're going to suffer and, you're, and they're going to make you suffer the most horrible way and they're sinners. And they're going to nail you to the cross. And that's a plan. It's a good plan. Let's look at Revelation 13, 8 where we, we need to go to know who our God is because there was here a revelation in all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast and everyone whose name has not been written when before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the world, before Adam and Eve was created, 
before sin came through Adam and Eve. You mean to say, before all of the, everything started, God had a plan to save sinners? It's right there. Before the foundation of the world, in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain, the Lamb that was slain is Christ Jesus. The book of life is Christ Jesus. There was a plan, a plan for redemption to save us who would believe in Jesus Christ. It was an eternal plan. It was a good plan. But it would require the Lamb to be slain. And, and it's a very kind word, to be slain. We, 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 we have a slaughterhouse. We understand slaughterhouse, wherein they, they'd be slaughtering animals there. You don't slaughter humans that way. We're kinder to humans when we process dead com decomposing bodies. But in, with animals... It's a, we treat them differently. It is the lamb that is going to be that was slaughtered. The lamb that was going to be killed in a very inhumane way. It is part of the plan. Now you'll see in the book of Acts, it was said in this way. Truly, in this city. Jerusalem, were gathered, they were gathered together against thy holy servant, Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. This is the, the, the case right now. They're re recounting what we're preaching right now in Jesus' moment. And what happened? That they would to do whatever thy hand and thy plan had predestined to take place. It was in accordance to the plan of God. Before eternity began, the lamb, the lamb that was slain would come. And he has come. And all of these things, all of the events that we are listening to the past months is happening. And it is in accordance to the plan of God. Why? Why would you say that? What, what, what was Jesus' aim? What was the, God's aim? That Jesus would suffer and die for the sins of of those that would believe in Him. The sins of those that would believe in Him. Today we sing songs of grace and love. The accomplishment of Jesus Christ on the cross. We sing it. We love it. It was not optional. The suffering and death of Christ had to be done for the purchase, for the ransom of the people, of the many that would believe in Him. In John 1.21 and 129, John the Baptist cries out on seeing Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember, the lamb that was slain, when John the Baptist, the herald, the one that comes to announce the Messiah's arrival, sees Jesus for the first time, the Holy Spirit comes upon him and gives him the words, and that he blurts out, Behold, here is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he's looking at Jesus Christ. How could that be, be done? Through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. 
Now you look at the Old Testament, wherein a, a prophet sees a vision of the Messiah. And, pro, and prophet Isaiah wrote, wrote this down. And he said, He, the Messiah, was hated and rejected. His life was filled with sorrow and terrible suffering. It is not a, you know, just the past few months of, the, of Jesus' life that he is suffering. Jesus is a man of sorrow, acquainted with terrible suffering for years. His 33 years of life here on earth, he was filled with sorrow and terrible suffering. And in this very moment, Isaiah writes, when he was suffering in the hands of the sinners, no one would want to look at him. We despise him. And he said, he's a nobody. They rejected, they would reject this man of sorrow. They would reject this Messiah, this man of love. They would reject this Savior, the one that could save them. They hated him. They despised him. He's a nobody. And verse 4 says, He suffered and endured great pain for us. And we even thought His suffering was because it was punishment from God. In verse 5, He was wounded and crushed because of our sins. By taking our punishment, He made us completely well. It was not His sin that He was being punished for. He was the innocent one. It was our sins that He was being punished for. You and yours and mine included. So Jesus suffers. He doesn't have to because He's the sinless one, but He suffers for a people that would believe in Him. And if you are a believer today, if you're listening and you're believing in Jesus Christ today, Jesus came to suffer and die for you. You could say, what was His aim? Was it just to forgive a bunch of sinners? And here's always, you got to remember about who God is. He never does things apart of His name's sake. He never does things that would not bring glory to Him. Be it in showing grace and mercy, being it in showing judgment and condemnation and throwing sinners to hell. He does this all for His name's sake, His glory. Why does He forgive you? Why does He promise to forgive you every time you go to Him and confess Him of your sins? Is it because you, you come to Him all humbled up and, and say, Lord, please forgive me? Is that the reason why He forgives you? Jesus tells us in 1 John, no. He says, if you confess your sins with your mouth, I will be faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It's not you. It's not that you deserve because you're, you have a contrite heart. He does it for His name's sake, His glory. And we get saved by His glory. We sing of His glory. We fall in love with His glory because his, He is good. And that includes, we have to believe that when God includes in His plan pain and suffering, He allows things He hates. Why? Why? For His name's sake to be glorified. For His glory to shine brighter. And for, his, for the people that would believe to praise Him more and more. Because He is glorious. Proverbs 6 tells us, Proverbs 6, 16 tells us, There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. And as you will listen to the seven things I will tell you that the Lord hates, you will see 
that it has been done upon Jesus, the innocent one. And his, he allowed it. Verse 17 of Proverbs 6 tells us, Haughty eyes, proud, pride, a lying tongue. These were proud people, filled with spiritual pride of self-righteousness, now making lies and accusations against Jesus, and hands that shed innocent blood. They would kill. They have plotted to kill. Now they're insisting and twisting Pilate and manipulating him to kill the innocent one. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies and one who spreads strife among brothers. Who were those that incited the crowd to chose Barabbas? People that God hates. Sin that God hates. And yet, God includes the things that He hates to happen to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knows fully that the sins that He hates the most will be done upon Him. And it's part of the plan He goes through willingly. And here is where it is his, the aim. For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Remember the book of life? The Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world? To be holy and blameless in His sight. The grace of God at work and His sovereign grace at work in love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ. In accordance with His pleasure and will. And verse 6 will result in the praise of His glorious grace. We sing of the cross. We got won over because of the cross of Christ. The suffering of Jesus Christ so wonderful. We look at it and we see and we could agree with it all, our whole heart. It was horrible. What was done upon Jesus was horrible. But there was something oh, so wonderful here that the darkest sins, the darker it was that man did to God, the brighter Christ and His glory shone. His innocence grew brighter. His holiness grew brighter. His love grows brighter. His grace grows brighter. He would go through all of that to save you and me. His name be glorified. Let me stitch it together. Why does Jesus have to go through suffering? Why must He suffer and die? And next week, we'll preach on His cross. Jesus on the cross. We have to understand, it was according to the eternal plan. Jesus came to suffer and die for the sins of those who would believe in Him. For the glory of His name. If you are able to believe this today, it's not because you're bright. It's not because you're intelligent. It's not because you have the ability to get it, to understand it. Because some people listening to this would react in this way. That's cosmic child abuse. That's wicked. That's evil. God could tamper with destination, the destiny of people. That's bad. And it's not because they're less intelligent. No. They are, they, they could be, they're probably more intelligent than us. The reason you could believe this and embrace this truth as the truth of God and who He is 
His sovereign grace at work in your life. It's not you. He takes all the glory. For us being able to come before Him and worship Him like this. But here's where a lot of us will str struggle. We, maybe when we are believers, we have no problem here of believing and loving God for His going through suffering and pain for me so that I don't have to. But that's talking about the eternal wrath of God, that you won't have to suffer the wrath of God. Jesus takes on the full wrath of God on the cross. The way we would misunderstand this wonderful truth is we think, well, Jesus came to suffer and die for me, so I don't have to suffer and die in this world, in this life. Give me comfort. Give me blessings. And then when suffering and pain come, it seems alien. I, I find myself surprised and again and again. Why is this happening to me? Why am I suffering so much? It's because you have not really understood what this means. Because some good intention, false teachers, wicked people at the core, but it will be very nice, will be very popular, has been preaching a different gospel, and we've been exposed to it. They preach that if you believe in Jesus Christ, all you have, is, you need is faith. You're not going to get sick. You're going to get healed every time you pray. But we know that historically, God has answered prayers, miraculous healings, yes. And there's also prayer for people, a whole multitude of people praying before God for healing. And God chose to say no. We have brothers and sisters who have lost babies at childbirth. We have brothers and sisters who have lost several limbs eyesight, can't see anymore. We have brothers and sisters who were sexually abused when they were babies, children. And they're, they're, they have all, they're growing up and have been for years with this pain and suffering. And if you're just preaching, oh, you just need to pray more. We just need to, you know, we have a wrong understanding of suffering, we would not be able to answer and handle question number two. When suffering comes your way, you won't be able to handle it. So let's see that this wonderful truth will not go to waste and we will just go in another direction and say, oh, thank God that He came to suffer and die that I don't have to in this world. Let's see. Here, remember Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane? Jesus is praying, now my soul is troubled. This is the Holy One, the Innocent One. God, He's going to take on the sins of those who would believe on Him. And He hates sin. He absolutely abhors sin. There's a struggle here that's real. The pain, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Here's also something. This is God. He's going to take on sin. He hates it. And what shall I say? He's saying, Father, save me from this hour. Meaning, let me not suffer. Don't let, let me not suffer like this. Should I say it like this? Should we pray to God, Lord, save me from this hour of suffering? And Jesus says, no, for this purpose I have come. I have come for the purpose to suffer and die. Part of God's saving plan, Jesus' plan to save us, the purpose that He has come, His mission is for Him to suffer and die. And He now says, Father, glorify Your name. Then a voice from heaven came from heaven. I've glorified it and I will glorify it again. Do you realize that part of us giving glory 
to Christ is because he has gone through suffering and pain. That he went through this purpose. He carried out all the way. So the purpose of God in suffering of Jesus Christ was to display the glory of His love and mercy to the praise of His saints throughout eternity. One of the ways or the reason why Jesus or God would allow suffering to come into this world and has allowed suffering to come into this world have you connected the dots? If there was no suffering in the world after the fall of the, at the Garden of Eden, there was still no suffering. The cross could not have happened. If there was no suffering for mankind, we don't know suffering. There's no suffering. God didn't allow suffering. Jesus would not have suffered and died on the cross. Do you realize that? One of the reasons why God would allow something He hates is so that we would see a display of His glory at Calvary. The greatest display of the glory of His love and mercy to be displayed at us when Christ would suffer at the hands of sinners. And we would praise as saints throughout eternity. Let's look at a glimpse of heaven, should we? Shall we? When John was given a glimpse of, what, of heaven and what is to come, John sees a great multitude and, they, and he writes, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. You suffered and died. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In heaven, surrounded by angels, and you, a true child of God, would be among them. What, we're, what are we going to do in heaven? We're going to sing. We're going to give praise to God. And we're going to give Him this song. To Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The Lamb that suffered and died. The Lamb that was slaughtered. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. We're going to sing our hearts out there. Just as we sing here, broken sinners that we are, saved by the grace of God today. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that, that suffering and pain, even though God hates it, He will allow it to come into your life. And that there is something good that will result from that. If you believe that in Jesus Christ, if you say amen and hallelujah to the Lamb that was slain, you're now ready to look at question number two. How do you make sense of our suffering? You see, I was in a meeting last week with our uh, beloved elders here, and, and one of them were saying he got sick with COVID and his wife, and they've never recovered fully. The wife now has a tendency to lose me her memory. And our beloved elder is saying, well, uh, my body is never not the same anymore. I really feel it's weakened. And one elder would say, M my, my leg is smaller, it's getting smaller because there's a pain in my knees, in my joints. We don't have to look far. We can just look at our bodies and we, need, we know it's dying every day. There's more and more pain each day. Some of us are going to be in agony for the rest of our lives, carrying some pain. Also ministering to someone and, it, and this person has a broken collarbone. 
and, and she's, she, her back is affected and she's in pain. And, and there's a lot of us that are, you know, in various degrees, really, there's, it's real. It's a real struggle to wake up each day because every day is painful. How do we make sense that it's our life? And you look, maybe you look at your neighbors and say, wow, they could bike. Wow, they could swim. Wow, they could run. They could still drive cars. Oh, and I can't even walk. I can't even sit down. And so much suffering. How do you make sense of a life like that? How do you make sense that when you're born, you don't have two arms and two legs? How do you make sense where, where in, when, when your child is born and you will have to take care of your child for the rest of your life because he doesn't have the mental capacity to be normal, to operate normally in the world? How do you make sense of these agonizing sufferings in life? In the gospel, you can find hope. See, there's more. Maybe it's your loved one. Maybe it's your children that's causing you grief. There's broken relationships in your home, and it seems impossible to tie. Every time there's an attempt, it's just causing more pain. Maybe there are... Uh, Differences that cannot be recon reconciled. Maybe impossible already. Just this week, I've visited two, funeral, two, two funerals. A mother died. A father died. And one, each, one day, all of us who are appointed to death will pass as well. And we don't know. It could be our wife. It could be our son. It could be our daughter. It could be me. It could be the dad. It could be our, our grandparents. Every day, we face the reality of suffering, don't we? Where are you looking for answers and hope? Allow me to point you to the Word of God. First Peter, this man who denied Jesus three times, now gets filled with the Holy Spirit and in later in the years writes this, for you have been called for this purpose. When you are saved by grace through faith, God was the one who called you and God didn't just call you and save you and bring you to heaven. He allowed you to remain in earth for a purpose. We all have been called for a purpose. We all have been saved for a purpose. We all have been blessed by God what, for a purpose. And what's that? Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. What is Peter saying here? Christ has called you and saved you for the purpose to suffer in this life. Do you realize the implication of that? When you become a believer of Jesus Christ, a disciple, God calls you to suffer in this life. Now we understand that God, when Jesus, when, when we see the promise of God that we would live our life and life in abundance, we would have life in abundance. Don't cut it and just say, oh, this is all that I want. Abundant life means all the blessing, all the good stuff. Part of the calling and of the abundant life that God calls you for is to suffer in this world. Just look at your bodies. Just look at your relationship. Just look at the world we're in. And here is where Peter points us to. Who, who Peter points us to. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. You look, when you're suffering... You look at Christ who suffered. I'm looking at my, at my Jesus Christ. I'm looking at how He suffered at the hands of sinners. You see, a lot of us, when we're suffering unjustly, we react, right? We say, oh, of course, they, what they did to me was wrong. You see, so I should act in this way. And all 
I'm, what I'm saying lang naman is the truth, right? And what we do is we don't follow Christ's meekness. We don't follow Christ's humility. We respond in pride and strength instead. You're not suffering the way God has called you for. You don't get any glory from that. You don't get any glory from, from suffering in a wrong way. God gets no glory away, uh, from that when you do it in a wrong way. So yes, everybody will, is suffering, but here's the reality. You can either suffer for the glory of God in, in the right way by faith, or you suffer trying to assert your own glory, protect your own pride in life, and you suffer wrongly. And you're not following in Christ. You're not living out and, li and following the example of Christ. He who committed no sin even when he suffered, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. That's what we do, right? You revile me, I'll revile you back. You insult me, I'll insult you back. You do bad things to me, I'll do bad things to you back. But he doesn't. He suffers righteously. We are called and saved for a purpose. To suffer. To suffer as Christ suffered. He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You look at all the blessings that we receive. And these are all true when we praise God that you've been given a new birth. The reason you're born again is because of grace. The Holy Spirit, like the wind, blowing wherever He wants. He, saved, he saves us. And now giving us an awakening, a uh, making us alive and being able to say, I cry out, oh, save me, O Lord. He gives us a living hope. He gives us an eternal inheritance in heaven. He gives us a new family, spiritual food. A royal priesthood and among others, so many things. We could come before Him, we could confess our sins and He will be faithful and just to forgive us. We come and call Him Abba, a very intimate relationship. All these blessings. And now, again, you might be inclined to think, these are the blessings of God when He saved me and you will not include pain and suffering as part of the package deal. When God saved you, we will suffer. You will suffer in this life. You will suffer for the very reason that you are now one of the light of the world. And the world that hates, that loves darkness will hate you. You will suffer for being a Christ follower. You will suffer more. Because it's common for us to feel all these things in our bodies. It's common whether you're a, a child of God or somebody who, who believes in another religion or other gods. For us to die, it's common for us to suffer because of sins of the world. But we will be called to suffer more. We will be called to suffer only that a child of God will suffer. So we've got to unlearn here wrong assumptions of the Christian life. Because it, where, if you have been anchoring your hope and peace in this world, that you will not going to go through suffering. If you've been anchoring that your, 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 your the standards of life, that you're not going to go through difficulties. Every time you go through difficulties, your business takes a hit. Your child gets sick. Your loved one goes to the hospital, the I ICU. Somebody that you know and treasure gets in an accident. The suffering that you would feel would tempt you to, to question the goodness of God because I thought you were just going to protect us. I thought you, we prayed every day. I put on the full armor of God every day. I, I pray and, and give faithfully. Why is this happening? And we would say, Lord, why, why, why is this happening? And we would be asking the wrong questions because it's coming from a wrong understanding of God.
But if you believe in the good news, you receive the gospel, you know that great good is coming from a good God that allowed pain and suffering to happen to His one and only Son. And now you are called for the same purpose. Saved you for a purpose. You, and in your suffering, just as in Christ and in His suffering, displayed the glory of God. You, in our suffering, you and I, when we suffer, either we give glory to God and other people will glorify God because of our suffering, or they will curse God and stumble over God because of how we respond to suffering. See, a lot of Christians, when they suffer, people will just observe them, cursing God, putting God's name in vain with their life. They get no, God gets no glory. You get no credit for that suffering, for that pain. Don't waste your pain and suffering. Here's where I'll give you three. Three. There's more. Oh, the Word of God is so wonderful. There's more. For the sake of time, we'll have three. Suffering. Number one, suffering is an expected part of the Christian life. Christ, He says, in this world, you will have trouble. And He will promise you, but take heart, take courage, don't give up. Don't ever stop giving, hoping, I have overcome the world. Second, second is this, God uses suffering to refine and test our faith and character. God will use suffering to refine and test our faith and character. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6 tells us, in this you greatly rejoice. Those who have gone through pain and suffering have hope. Jesus has overcome the world. You can rejoice greatly, though now for a little while. Even though for a little while, and the little while of God is this, all your life, <laughs> throughout your life, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Greatly rejoice. What's going to happen? These th have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. God allows the things that He hates to come into your life in accordance to His will. Just look at Job. Just look at the Old Testament. Look at the New Testament. Look at His one and only Son. Look at the apostles and the epistles. They suffered and died. And these come, have come so that you will be tested. One of the great blessings now for going through suffering is that when you go through suffering and you find yourself still holding on more, even more desperately to God, you can say, praise God, my faith is tested. It's genuine. I'm not a weather, weather long Christian. I'm not just here for the good times. Because even here, when the Lord has taken away everything, I can still say from the bottom of my heart and soul, praise be to you, O God. And when you have tested and go through the fire, He's refining your character. He's refining your faith. And many, some of us will say, I don't want that fire. I don't want that suffering. And get out. And ultimately reveal in their deepest hearts, who they really are, not real children of God. In other words, 
the assurance of God that whoever believes in Him truly will be held by Him, will be preserved by Him from beginning to end, and they will endure whatever kinds of trials and suffering and fear they will reveal in their actions when they would now hate and abhor suffering and trial. They would not have any reasons to greatly rejoice because their faith is not in God. Their faith is in good circumstances, good things, and not the good God. So what's happening? You see, when you're tested and refined in genuine faith, it results now in rewards. Rewards, praise, glory, and honor when Jesus comes back. So for a little while, 80 years, for a little while, what is that compared to all eternity? Suffer 100 years, I count everything as lost. Let's go. Suffering, and third, will prepare you to receive eternal rewards in heaven. God is going to make up for whatever you suffer here on earth with far more precious worth in heaven. You love your strength? It's going to last you five, 10, 15 years. Eternity? Forever. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. Your light and momentary troubles, that's how you greatly rejoice. Because my perspective now is that this troubles, even though I, I don't think they're light, okay? These are serious things. But you could look at it in a way compared to eternity, they're light, they're momentary, they're temporary. And they will now achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is, what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Don't be afraid that your life here will be ruined. Don't be afraid that your, your business will go all topple down and you're going to have to start from scratch. Don't be afraid. These are light and momentary troubles. The God who has taken care of the lilies on the field and the birds in the air will take care of you. He will see every sorrow and pain you go through. And if you are tested and refined, you will receive far, eternal, far more precious eternal rewards. It will be worth it. And I think it will be preached next Sunday, definitely. On the cross, Jesus goes there with that in mind. Now I'll close with this to, to illustrate and live out our point. You see, there's a bunch of us here, sisters that I love, that are really, really into, brothers, sisters and brothers, they, they are really into hiking and mountaineering and going to uh, high places, you know, and, and I uh, found, find them again and again that they would be here, uh, they would be making plans, and they would be, you know, hardly sleeping. They would wake up 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, just to go to these far, remote places. And you know when they're making a plan, they're saying, oh, we're going to go to this peak. But we're going to go to this mountain. But along the way, you know it's going to get really, really hard. The trail is not easy. There's going to be mosquitoes. There's going to be danger. There's going to be uh, thorns. There's going to be rocks that will maybe cut. And, you know, the, even the way is going to tire you out. It's going to exhaust you. It's going to be a hard trail. But here's what mountaineering people can get. That's why I, I know that in the concept, we already get this. It's just that when it comes to our faith and suffering and personal suffering, we start to uh, be unbelievers. But we get this, right? We get this, that, that they would willingly spend money, they would willingly go with the plan, that they would be, climb this mountain, they know that it's going to go through, they're going to go through suffering and trials and pain, in other words, 
And see, the, the going will get tough. Some of us would look like this. You know, oh, I'm so tired, I want to give up. And when I ask them, do you want to give up? You know, turn back. I, I read a comment, kaya pa jai. And, 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 and the reply was, kaya pa, yes. I'm going to go on. Even though I'm going through this, I want to go on. Why? Well, it's not, this is not the, this is not yet. See, this trail that I am is not yet. I want to go. I want to get there. I'm willing to go through this hardship and pain because I want to get there. A destination in mind. So what happens? When you get into destination, you, you get a change of clothes for your Instagram moment, right? And you climb up a big rock where you can now bask in the glory of your destination and the beauty of it. Wow, thank you, Lord, for such a beautiful creation. And I wear my shades now, right? Because, you know what? You, you don't even think like what you went through, what you had to go through, it makes it all worth it when you get there. Then when you now see and look at these visions of glory, you're not going to see them just sitting in your couch at home. You're not going to enjoy this sunlight, this breath of fresh air, if you don't go through that hardship of walking and planning, you're not going to be able to rejoice with brothers and sisters who went through the journey with you because you're going to be at home and they're going to be on top of the mountains. And they're now looking and, and, and breathing in the fresh air. Why? Because they went there. And now you see these things, you're not going to be able to enjoy and give the glory. You see, we get that, right? We get that in, in the concept of going through, knowing that we're going to go through a hardship, certain hardship and trials, you will be willing to go through that even though you know it in, in advance because there's a destination in mind. There's a far more worthy destination that will make up whatever we have spent whatever energy, whatever pain, and whatever blood we have shed along the way is going to be worth it in the end. You'll see. So I invite you this morning that in your life, you look at your Savior. You look at His suffering and pain. You know in your heart, your heart soar in joy that He goes through that. It was great good and, and glory that came out of that, we will sing for all eternity the glory of God through His pain and suffering. And now you look at your life and you look at the suffering you are going to go through and are going through. And you prepare for glory. You grit yourself. Get through it. It is a light, momentary affliction. It is, I'm going to go through fire. It's going to be painful. But there's far more greater rewards in store that will make it worthwhile. Let's give God a mighty clap of praise.